Okay, right. Uh, after all the little discussion that we had about the IWC and how fantastic we are, we already know it. And uh, we are uh, welcoming all the, the new members, the, the guests that we have from another countries. Uh, I must say it is a pleasure to have you here. Okay, um, the new world. Um, quite a few of you uh, were with us when we were talking about uh, the Silk Road and what happened. It was 1,500 years of Silk Road, 1,500 years, 1,500 years of trade and exchange between Rome and what was called the Indies, it was also China, Indonesia. It was a ma major, major exchange of technology, ideas, goods, culture, inventions. But by the year 1453, uh, the Ottomans, um, managed to constant finally Constantinople. It was the fall of Constantinople that is been in the in the hands of the of the Greeks and hands of the Romans and hands of the Europeans. The fall of Constantinople means the end of Europe and what we call today Turkey. And they closed the gate. It was no more going from the east into the Mediterranean. That brought a tremendous, tremendous chaos in Europe because suddenly you didn't have the trade, you didn't have the money, you didn't have the culture, you didn't have the goods. And as you imagine, there were millions of people who were living off the, in the, off the Silk Road trade, of the caravans, of the hotels, of the guides, of whatever. So obviously, the fall of Constantinopla, Constantinopla, it was really the end of the road for the Silk Road. But there were too many people interested in that. So that couldn't happen. Therefore, we found out that they start to look for different ways to make it again to the Indies, to the Indies and into China. What happened? You couldn't do it over land. So the other possibility was to do it by sea. But remember, in those days, uh, the sea travel was not really uh, much, much uh, developed. They had uh, new uh, ships that were very, very important. The caravel with new rigging, new design, they make traveling much easier. They had new instruments. They finally had a compass, which means they could travel without having the, the sun as a reference. And they had gunpowder that would give them protection. But at the same time, the problem was that, uh, uh, sorry, I got a bit of a problem here. Let's go. Um, <laughs> Let's go one more. It's not going. Um, I don't know what is happening. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I have a technical problem. My PowerPoint is frozen. Um, uh, Will I stop I, screen sharing for a moment, Liliana, for you? Sorry. Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen sharing for a moment if you're happy with that. Okay, yes, I'm trying desperately. Um, okay, right, now I'm going to get into share screen. I'm going there, um, and we'll get that going. Right, a slide show. Uh, a slide show. Um, well, I'll carry on talking in the in the meantime. I say we had these problems. Let's see if we can. Yes, there we are. There we are again. As I say, the problem with traveling was, as I mentioned before, that everybody uh, at that time they believe that there were enormous sea monsters that will get hold of the boats or and of the people and uh, they will take them down, they will kill them. And the, the, probably the biggest problem of all was that they believed that the earth was flat, which means when you came to the edge of it, you were going to fall down and disappear. Therefore, they were, the traveling was only done staying very close to the coast. And we had um, a king, the one you see in the corner there, that was Enrique de Navegante, Enrique de Cifer, who was a king of Portugal. He was fascinated with travel and not so much fascinated with kingship. And he spent a lot of money and a lot of resources trying to go beyond into the Atlantic. 
And that bring that means he went beyond the portico of Hercules, the Atlas, and into the coast of Africa. And he found that following the coast of Africa, eventually, and as we all know, he made uh, the, the, the Portuguese stop and what escaped, and especially when it was Natal, they could actually make it all the way to the other side. But there was another captain. He was called Cristofalo Columbus. He had a complete different idea. He believed that the earth was round, which means if you keep on going enough, going and going and going west, eventually you are going to come to the other side, on the east side, and you were going to find the Indies. Of course, he was going around all the courts of Europe, and nobody believed that they all thought he was completely mad, and they were not prepared to support the expedition. But on the other hand, Isabella and Fernando of Aragon and Castilla had, after long years of battling, had managed to push the Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, that had cost them a lot of money and a lot of people. They were owing more of that money. They were broken. Therefore, they felt they had nothing to lose. And this was something that would have a lot of promise. And so they financed three of those new caravels that could go beyond into the sea. Um, they had to borrow the money for that. Therefore, they just gave him convex to try the expedition. And so eventually, after so many years, Cristobal Colón start this trip to try to prove that the earth was round. And therefore, as you can see there, where he lived from the south, in the south of Spain, crossing the Atlantic, and he believed that if he went enough, he was going to find land, which he did. Of course he did. After three months and a mutiny, he found land. But what he didn't understand is it was a whole continent in between Europe and Asia. And that's what later was going to be called the Americas. But at the time, they would call it the Indies. Why the Indies? Well, what, the Indies was what the name that was given at all that part that we say China, Japan, Indonesia. And he thought he had arrived there. And it's this so that even today, the, in, the indigenous people of the Americas in Spanish are called Indios because that's what they saw. They saw they had arrived at the in, uh, to, in, to the land of the Indios. Uh, anyway, that was 1492, right? But he had arrived and he thought he had discovered a new continent. But that was not quite the case. Uh, 13,000 years ago, the people coming from Siberia, at a time where the Bering Sea didn't exist because of the glaciation, a lot of people and a lot of animals have moved into the Americas. And as you can see there on each side, these are all the different indigenous groups that came to being after that migration. And on top of that, they have not discovered anything. By the time they arrived, there were pastoralists living in um, living in North and North, what we call today North America, and incredible, incredible empires in what is Mesoamerica, which is Central America and South America. So most definitely, they have not discovered anything. They were just uh, finding that their knowledge of the rest of the world was very limited. Uh, sorry, I want to remove this from here, but I don't seem to be able to do it. Okay. Um, therefore, when we are talking <laughs> again, <laughs> this problem with this. Uh, we know that also in the year 1000, the Viking had made it to North America. As you can see there, there were, um, uh, I want to remove that, um, living from Scandinavia there from the north, you can see they did, they did a trip through Iceland, Greenland, and they came to very much the north of North America. Later, the Vikings will go to places much better for them, like north of Europe and of course, England and Ireland. But in the year 1000 AD, we have full archaeological evidence that the Vikings have created a colony 
and the north of North America, a colony that didn't really take off because obviously they found better places. But if we're going to go to that, uh, as we must remember that the first people who came to, the first Europeans who came to, to uh, North America uh, were the Vikings, not the Europeans. Um, you can see there, uh, there is even um, armor for the Vikings that was found in England. So there is no question that it were not the Spaniards, the first Europeans who made it to the Americas. Anyway, but as I say, in, um, in the Americas, there were amazing empires, very much alive. Uh, probably one of the most important was the Aztec empire, which they are called, the Aztec actually means the people of the Valley of Mexico. Uh, that was in 1492, they had a very, very developed uh, culture. Uh, they had fantastic cities. They were great engineers, very good at agriculture. They, have, uh, they had found many, many ways to, to, um, to create and to uh, cultivate different plants. And already they were mixing different vegetables. They were very, very, um, very, very sophisticated. Uh, the capital it was Tenochtitlan. Now, Tenochtitlan means a capital built on a lake. And that is actually quite amazing because uh, the legend says that one day a priest will spot a needle perched on a cactus holding a snake. This will be the sign that they have found their home. And as they were moving down this group of Aztecs, they did see that. And that was. In the, on an island in the middle of a lake, and that was Lake Texcoco. Therefore, they started building their amazing capital, Tenochtitlan, what we call as Mexico City today. But the incredible thing is, as you can see there on the bottom corner, obviously the island was not big enough. The island in the middle of the lake was not big enough to create their capital. So they were creating floating islands in the lake that they were uh, uh, attaching to, to, to the main island. And they created an enormous, enormous artificial floating city. And that is still exists. I will show you later, uh, if you go to Mexico City um, and Cochino, the gardens of Cochimilco. So as I say, we are talking about a very, very sophisticated culture. Um, and they, have, they, they had a calendar, they knew, uh, they understood the seasons, and they understood completely the, the movement of the stars at the time of 1492. Um, the Aztecs of that pyramid, as you can see, it still exists, and the pyramids of, of, of the sun and the moon. And they were so sophisticated that they knew that the year already has 365 days, so much so that so that pyramid, it got 365 steps, one step for every day of the year. Um, the state society was very structured. They were based on agri agriculture, as I say, trade, and guided by religion. The Aztec societies dominated by pyramids, topped with temples where human sacrifices provided the gods with the human blood. Uh, the pyramids, the same case that in uh, the Egyptians, as they, we're talking about the Valley of Mexico. Therefore, the pyramids were their mountain to be close to the gods. We see that in many cultures. Uh, they were very strong on education, which was free for all. Uh, they taught religious rituals, singing, dancing and music, which of course, dancing and music, remember, was very much an offer to the gods. Uh, Passed the tradition from one generation to the next, mostly through stories. And they had separate school for the, no for the nobles and the matrilin. The nobles were obligated to do civic service for the empire. Okay. Therefore, that's why they had the civil school. In fact, they had to study harder to prepare themselves to take the duty for the empire. And they were schooled from the very early teens until they got married. So that we have the Aztecs living there in the Valley of Mexico. In the meantime, we know that the Spaniards so far, they only had arrived at what are the islands. First, Colón arrived at the Bahamas, and they later moved a little bit more 
and they made it to Cuba, which was called La Española, the Spanish ones. And they had different colonies around with the islands of what we call the Caribbean today, but they haven't made it to the mainland yet. Uh, so in um, 1517, we found that um, they really is when they make the first move to get to the coast of what we call today Mexico. Um, in the name of looking for gold, God, and glory. Uh, remember that a lot of these people, Spain was very poor at the time. So these people who were coming across were really looking for a possibility to make, uh, to make some money to kind of achieve something uh, to take back home. Um, so here we have it. They disembarked for the first time in Mexico and they made the, what will be the, the emperor, the king of the Aztecs at the sun, which was Moctezuma. Uh, the interesting thing was, Moctezuma was a bit confused about these people. It was going to happen the same to the Incas, because in their tradition, uh, one day there will come a redeemer, it happened in other religions too, who's gonna come back uh, to join his people or to pass judgment or whatever. So Moctezuma wasn't quite sure who these people were. They had different coloring, they were wearing armor, which was very shiny, and they were riding this incredible beast that they never had seen before, which is the horse. And the interesting thing was that we are talking about very few Spaniards on that boat, when we're talking about thousands of locals. So now how did it happen and what did it happen? As you can see there, there are two completely different civilizations. We got Cortes on one side, we got Moctezuma on the other, we got the priest of, of the Aztec with a special mask, and we got, of course, the church on the other side, because everything that was done in the name of God and the church and the cross. And it was a major um, meeting of cultures and a complete lack of understanding of who was who. Uh, the Spaniards didn't realize the civilization that they were uh, confronting. And, um, and on the other hand, the, um, the Aztecs, and what's going to happen again with the Incas, um, were very trusting. So these are very few people. They obviously uh, come, um, come in, in a, uh, with good intentions. Also, they have been, uh, at that time, they have been a uh, comet flying uh, over the over the that part of the world. So a great portent was supposed to happen. And so of course, uh, <laughs> uh, between 1519, which was the time when Cortes uh, arrived for the first time in Metro Suma, and 1521, we're talking about only two years, Hernán Cortes and a small band of men brought down the Aztec Empire and conquered it. How could that happen? I mean, we're talking about very, very few people and against all, all of the people of the Aztec Empire. Well, there were quite very important elements there. As you can see, they had the oh, horses. They get, the horses gave them mobility. They were this incredible, uh, uh, this incredible beast, heavenly beast that they didn't understand. Uh, at the same time, the Spaniards were wearing armor. They had protection. Of course, they had gunpowder. And that was tremendously demoralizing because the way that the, the, the Aztec could fight, they would just throw the people against, and of course, they would just be decimated by gunpowder. Also, they have made alliances, as you see in the bottom, with some of the enemies of the Aztecs. Of course, all the subjugated tribes. As you can see, there is an element that you see a lot in the photograph. There is a woman there. That was the Malinche. Malinche was a, a translator. Somehow, she got picked up in the Islands of Cuba. She, and she learned the language of Spanish, and she was a great supporter of Cortes. There is all kind of romantic stories that she was the lover. Uh, Malinche was a tremendous help to the Spaniards to contact the other tribes. And probably the most and most important enemy 
of the Aztecs, and it was going to be to all the native indigenous people of the Americas with the pestilence. The European pestilence eventually went to kill 80% of all the Native Americans, which were found in 1492. That was probably the greatest enemy of the indigenous. And of course, the pestilence was brought by the conquistadores and they were completely immune to it. So we have that in between 1519 and 1529, the Aztecs were conquered. Uh, but then they got hold of what they really wanted, which was the Aztec gold. And the Aztec gold started flowing into the coffers of Europe. And what you see here is, well, I recommend if any of you travel, the archaeological music of Mexico City is one of the most amazing museums you're going to find. If you cannot travel in Mexico, just go to a museum because you're going to have even reproductions of the pyramids and the temples. This is the, the gold that survived. You have no idea how much gold went to the other side. It was incredible. And the story is a lot of that was just melt down at the source or beaten into any shape so they could accommodate more into, into the boat. The grid was incredible. And what it was done to this work of art is uh, we, we really uh, have lost so much of that for, the, for humanity culture. Uh, as you can see there, there were 8,000 pounds of gold and silver that were taken at the beginning of the, conquest, of the conquest, not to mention plenty of feathers, cotton, shirts, and more. Immediately, the locals were made into slaves, and the Spaniards who were living, who, who were part of the first wave, they all were given lands. Later, we're gonna go to the famous encomiendas, which means uh, the church and the king were given any Spaniard who wanted, the land that they wanted to take, mostly they wanted the mines, of course, and a certain number of the slaves, and that they could work whichever way they wanted, and a portion of that had to go to the church and the crown. Um, some of these beautiful pictures that I'm using here uh, are from Diego Rivera, which is a great, great painter who did uh, done amazing murals. Um, again, if you go to Mexico, you're gonna find them in a lot of the public buildings. And uh, he represent very, represented very much the time of the conquista. Uh, the encomienda system. Okay, the encomienda system was used by the Spanish crown during the Spanish colonization of the Americas to regulate the Native Americans and to reward individual Spaniards for services to the crown. The Spaniards would extract tribute from the natives in the form of labor, gold, or other products, and subjected them to punishment or death. It was complete and total slavery, and millions died. That was the aspects. Now, let's move a little bit there. Um, we all have heard about the Incas, right? As you can see on the map up there, the Aztec Empire was in the Valley of Mexico. Um, in 1526, Pizarro, the gentleman on the top, arrived in Peru and heard stories of a great ruler and his riches in the mountains. Um, that was the time everybody was talking about the famous El Dorado. El Dorado means the golden one. And they were supposed to be this famous city where everything was made of gold with a king who was the complete and total ruler. And he was the one who could uh, contain and produce the gold within the borders of the sea. Still, the, the legend of Dorado exists. Never mind, uh, he heard of El Dorado and he returned to get permission to claim the land for Spain. King Charles agreed to Pizarro's request and promised him that he would be governor of any lands he conquered. It's very interesting. He decided to go back to ask his king, and of course the church, if he should be, should be all right to go and, and take those lands for Spain. Never mind, nobody asked the locals, of course. Um, as you can see, 
it was a very difficult. One thing was to get to the coast of Mexico, uh, like Cortez did. In this case, this guy, you can see my arrows there. You see the, the Caribbean, that's the way to Europe. But he had to come to the edge, and the Caribbean to the edge of the land, which is where today is Panama. They had to go over Panama. I mean, they had to carry the boat over Panama. And now, of course, it's different. There is a canal there. They had to get the boat over, reassemble them again, and come all the way to uh, today's Lima. It was a major enterprise. Eventually, when they conquered uh, the Incas, what they did is they had boats based in there, which was called the Pacific Fleet. And those boats would go all the way to Panama. Still, the treasure had to go over by donkeys, take it to the other side, and put on boats again. So it was a major, major, um, um, uh, much work that had to be done about it. But of course, what they were going to find there was so much, so rich, so fabulous that it made it worse totally. So um, they eventually managed to make it to the Ink Empire. Uh, what we have seen here now, uh, I put here a photograph that in reality um, are my photographs taken in the present. So we don't quite know what this is, the ruin, this is what is left over. So you can imagine what it was when he arrived there. Um, I mean, look at us, I put on perfect, that is a celebration of the Inti, the Inti is the sun, that they still um, do, um, uh, they have festivals for. But you can see the size of the stones behind that. And those stones, there's no cement in between. They were cut as they are, as you can see there, and they remain as they were built at the time. Uh, the other, uh, they had a very, very, uh, a very big uh, pop, uh, society. They have beautiful temples, many, many cities, very advanced government with a tax system and a huge road system too. I'm going to go into the road system just now. There is, a, I think everybody has seen the famous photograph of Machu Picchu. But the truth is, Machu Picchu was only a city for the nobility to live in the mountains. That was not the capital of the Inca Empire. The capital of the Inca Empire was closer to what we call today Lima, and that was Cajamarca. The Inca was there. So in fact, when the Incas eventually were conquered, uh, Machu Picchu was left abandoned. There was no nobility to live there. And uh, obviously the roofs and everything were made of reeds and of wood, and that had disappeared. But for those who have been to Machu Picchu, and you probably know how difficult it is to get there. Imagine how difficult it must have been to build there. Um, and it's still standing. So, as we said, the Inca Empire, um, which existed between the years uh, 1200 and 1535, the Inca population lived on the part of South America, extending all the way from Ecuador, Ecuador, to the Pacific coast of Chile. And uh, it was much bigger than the Mayas and then the Aztecs. Uh, it had uh, an enormous number of different, um, how we call it, tribes that they all uh, were under the rule of the Inca and they all paid tribute to Cajamarca, to the capital. Um, as you can see on the side there, that is just some of the jewelry to be worn by the Inca. The Inca was what was called the emperor. And those are some of the pieces that still exist. And they are in the Gold Museum of Lima, uh, which I most definitely recommend that you see it. Realizing how much was destroyed and that everything practically is gone, and you see everything that is there, you have an idea of, of the size of the whole and the richness that existed. Um, we were talking earlier on about the empire of the Inca. They were amazing because it, the empire was across many different, many different climates from mountains, crossing rivers, uh, to the flat, what they call the hot flight, the hot flight area, hot flat areas of South America, all in the Cordillera 
And uh, as you can see, some of those are um, photographs, that kind of rivers, you know, the hanging rivers, they still exist, they still have the technology. You're gonna be in places there like, like the Cordillera Blanca, which is magnificent to do hiking. And the people of the Inca Empire had roads, uh, a road network of 25,000 miles. That is longer than the longest a freeway to the United States. And they were going through forests, mountains, and desert. The very interesting thing is they didn't have the wheel. They haven't invented, they didn't have the wheel as a means of transport. All transport was on Yama, Guanaco, and uh, all obviously um, in the case of very important people, they were using uh, a slave labor for it. So, um, a lot of that land still these days remains uh, connected by the old Inca roads. They are more than 500 years old. So I wanted to show you here, I was talking to you about what great architects there were. Um, uh, you can see the way they, they were building that agriculture, they were, they were uh, cultivating uh, because of course it was mountain. So they had to have uh, the mount, they have to cultivate in steps, and that way the water will be used differently. So they had different vegetables planted in different parts on the high, on the higher step and the lower steps. Again, you can see there those walls that I was telling you about it, and um, you can see in the corner of the bottom corner there, that is one of the very very few temples left in Cusco because. The same like with the Aztec, what the, the conquistadores did was that they destroyed the temples existing to use the stone to build their churches and the, the, we would call it the municipal halls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that one, the corner is still left there. And on top of it, um, I was hiking, yes, in Oriente Tambo. You see that door there and those windows here. You can see the trapezoid shape. That is because they had earthquakes or they had timbers, you know, that, that was in the Andes. So they know that that way, the building will have much more stability. Uh, as I said, they were very good engineers. They had a tremendous knowledge of how to, how to uh, build and how to build to last. And it lasted indefinitely. So, but, uh, Pizarro timing for the conquest was perfect. By 1532, the Inca Empire was embroiled in a civil war. They had decimated the population and divided the people loyalties. Sending his brother Hernan as an envoy, Pizarro invited Atahualpa. Atahualpa was at the time the emperor, the great emperor, the Inca, back to Cajamarca for a feast in honor of Atahualpa's ascendance to the throne and attack and kidnap. Again, they didn't have the numbers, but they are very good at treasury. They were very good at subtle subterfuge. And that is the way they got him. They invited to party, they kidnap him, they kill all the ones who came with him, and they put a price to his head. They told Atahualpa, we will let you go free if you fill a room once with gold and twice with silver in exchange for his release. The room still exists. It is a big room. And so people from all over the kingdom started coming with gold and silver to pay the kidnappers of Atahualpa. Well, the, the price was paid and yet Atahualpa was still killed as an heretic by the church in the Spanish. So, uh, so much for glory. <laughs> and uh, so um, again, uh, in a very short time, uh, a whole civilization, it was destroyed. And enormous amount of gold went to Europe. 24 tons of gold were looted from the Incas. Now, 25 tons of gold, and as you know, I'm a jeweler, we are talking about um, close to 1,000 ounces of gold. 
I mean, one million ounces of gold, one million. Just work out the price of an ounce of gold and that tell you the fortune that was looted from the empire. And what happened with that gold? Well, that's what we want to know. The gold was used by the Spanish monarchy to pay off thirty debt. As I say, they owed tremendous amounts of money for the for uh, the, con the reconquest of their land from the Moors. And um, but they also went to found the religious world supporting the papacy against the reformers. And there is a wonderful um, um, painting I got from the call. There is, uh, as usual, um, the the famous. Christians, the most famous Catholic wars against themselves. And there was a comment of the Ottomans thinking those crazy Christians uh, spending an enormous amount of money just fighting for a small difference as differences within their religion. Um, but it, then you can see pointed that altar of the church in Seville, uh, tons, tons of gold on there. And uh, besides, that the goal, they remember they were financing wars, they were building, and that goal, therefore, started to filter to other European countries who benefited from the Spanish wealth. Um, the Spanish also were very able to were able to purchase some precedented quantity of imported luxury goods from around the world. Um, by the year 1400, just before the Renaissance, we remember that Europe had very little gold, gold as coins that we understand. There was very, very little gold. So it was a lot of a system of barter. And uh, the wealth at the moment was maybe kind of letters of, of, let's say, you are the owner of so-and-so and therefore there is the price, but you didn't have the actual coins to validate that. Now suddenly, this enormous amount of gold coming to Europe, we're going to change completely the mercantile face of the continent. Suddenly we're gonna have bankers. Suddenly people were gonna be able to say or to put a, a solid value to things. And it was going to change completely the way uh, Europe was gonna be trading. So we're gonna have the new class, the bourgeoisie, the mercantile class that we're gonna develop in Europe. It changed completely the society of the time. And then in Asia, close to Japan, it was um, Manila, today the Philippines, that became a colony of the Spaniards. So what the Spaniards were doing is all the things from the East, they were getting there in the Philippines and they were sending them to Mexico and the, fam the famous Manila galleons. And from there we'll go again over Panama and on the other way to Europe. So they have found another way to make it to the famous Indies. So this, the Spanish were in clover. They became one of the most powerful uh, nations of Europe. And of course, the kings, uh, Isabella and Fernando, were terribly respected. They were the great supporters of the Catholic Church. And remember, this was the time where the church was having the big break between uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants. So a lot of money of, that came from Spain went to support the Catholic Church on their problems, on their war with the Protestants. I'm sure that the Indians, I'm sure that the Aztecs and the Incas uh, didn't really, uh, were very uh, happy with the destiny of their gold. Uh, but there is one group I haven't talked about and I left it for the end, that were the Mayas. Uh, the Mayas lived in what it is uh, Yucatan. Uh, you can see there the Maya, air, Maya area is Yucatan. Today it's also Mexico. And, um, but the difference was, of course, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, and a small part of El Salvador and Honduras. Why the Mayas were different? Well, the Mayas were not, they, they were not centralized around one important capital with one important uh, king. They were more like a federation of different, of different cities. Therefore, it was not like if you conquer this and you took the king, you had the empire in your hands. Therefore, um, as you can see there, the Spanish conquest of the Maya was a very protracted conflict in the Spanish colonization. Well, there's what the, the, the Maya did, um, they just retired themselves 
to the to the to the jungle, and or they went to stay with other tribes uh, that they were not conquered by the Spaniards, and that way they were not conquered immediately and definitely. Uh, I think we got somebody there that had to unmute herself, Carol. Um, uh, thank you. Oh dear. Okay, thank you very much. Don't worry, we all have technological problems. I also have something here, but anyway. So um, I, I personally find, uh, I travel in that part of the world, and I find that the Maya ruins are probably the most romantic uh, ruins left in Mesoamerica. Many of, the, many of them, like Palenque, for instance, is a photograph you have there. Uh, on the on the left hand side, uh, Palenque is. In fact, you have to go through a jungle entrance, and then you open up into this part where you're going to have the, the most beautiful temples. But we're talking Pal uh, Palenque, Chichen Itza, amazing places. Of course, eventually they were also conquered, and um, and interesting enough, uh, a lot of that people completely disappear into the jungle of Guatemala and what is today Guatemala. I had the privilege to spend about, my husband and myself, who spent about six months in the Petén, in the lake of the, in, in Lake Petén, uh, living there with the last of the Mayas, which are uh, called the Itza Maya. And uh, funny enough, they who survive in higher numbers than the Incas and the Aztecs, those are the people that today are suffering so much and they are in these terrible caravans trying to make the Mexico-American border. Um, and they took them longer, but they've been just as oppressed and they are just going through the same problems of genocide and civil war. Anyway, I really, really uh, recommend if you travel, this is Palenque. Don't tell me that it's not beautiful and most romantic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really love to make, I, I was very, very happy uh, to be able to visit Palenque. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, um, uh, a world within a world, you know, and um, uh, it's always, it's in the rainforest. So uh, it is uh, a place that is kind of seem to have been there forever, belongs to the environment in which it is. but. There are other beautiful places of the Maya. Uh, let me let me get my ugly face out, out of there. So, uh, oh sorry, uh, yeah, right. Uh, you can see the Usmal, Chichen Itza, Teotihuacan, Tulum. I mean, Tulum is beautiful. Tulum is on the on the on the sea. The, the, those ruins are extremely extremely beautiful. And because, as I say, they were not in a city. Uh, they were all in different uh, small populations. There was a, a, a small towns. Um, the buildings were not destroyed to build other important colonial buildings. And um, the Maya was a small, probably the smallest of, of, of the three uh, empires of the time, but their culture and their astronomical knowledge was incredible. So there we have, and that is where we are now. The Spanish conquest and the colonies, let me get out of here. Uh, yeah, okay, right. Um, they we're talking about by the 1600s, the Spanish empire consisted of a part of North America. We must remember that all that, that it is now California, New Mexico, and much more, all that was part of, of Spain, right? That's why, in fact, if you, when people go these days to California and all that, they will find things like, you know, San Diego, Los Angeles, and the uh, Las Cuencas. Um, all that part um, was part of the Spanish um, empire, part of North America, Central America, the Caribbean islands, and much of South America. Uh, in fact, they have, uh, they have created a pact, the Pact of Tordesillas together with Portugal, in which Portugal, there is a meridian, and Portugal, you can see the meridian there, um, is, is that line that's coming down from the top, close to the cross uh, skull and bones. Um, from there to the 
west. It was all to be uh, to be uh, belong to Spain. To the other side was Portugal. That's why Brazil belongs to Portugal in the Americas. It's the only country belonging to Brazil, and of course, all the African coast. But now, I was explaining to you how the treasure was coming from Peru. You see the the arrows there come from Lima, cross by. Um, by a horse or by whatever caravans or animals they had across Panama. And then we had to take the boat and make it all the way on the Atlantic to go to, to Europe. But of course, <laughs> that was the problem. And as we know, when there are there is treasure, there are robbers. And there was treasure indeed. And then there were robbers indeed. Right, the pirate the famous pirates of the Caribbean. Our <laughs> beloved, I think uh, the par the, oh, there is so much legend and we all enjoy so much the story of the pirates. And um, they were there, there were many islands in between the Caribbean and it was very easy to actually uh, hide themselves and arrive on the galleons at the last moment. Remember these galleons were very, very heavy with treasure. They didn't have, they couldn't maneuver fast. And the, let's say the pirates were the rebels of the time. They were also a bit like the rock and rollers of the time, you know. And I love when I was doing some research, they obviously, uh, um, some of them were, I will give you some names, some of them were, became terribly famous. They are famous even now. Um, Black Bear, probably one of the most. And he said that in honest work, the food is bad. The wages are low and the work is hard. And piracy, there is plenty of loot, it's fun and easy, and we are free and powerful. The worst that can happen is that you can be hanged. And they were hanged, of course. <laughs> As you can see there, um, those, the, those coins, uh, so much treasure was stolen, and so much treasure end up on the bottom of the sea, unfortunately. Uh, they say that probably about a third of all that it went through end up in the bottom of the sea. Um, there is a lot of um, modern uh, um, divers, uh, actually, which have been doing a lot of rescue of, of, those, um, of, the, of those galleons. And that is some of the scene that they have found. You see that those very basic coins that were made at the time, they were melting it and put in a very basic stamp in Mexico, but it was much easier than take the actual pieces and they could put more on the galleons. And uh, as you can see there, um, there was silver, uh, gold and silver. And the interesting thing is that it was completely pure gold and silver. Um, I wanted to show you now this. That was very much the scene of the times, you know. Um, the pirates were very well organized, actually. Uh, they were private entrepreneurs, because later I'm going to, not everybody was private entrepreneurs. They were very much uh, small businesses. And uh, they created, sometimes they had definitely more than one boat. And most of them had bases in different, they were based in different islands. Uh, for instance, Black Bear Fitch, we all know. Captain Henry Morgan, we all have heard about. Calico Jack and Anne. Now, Anne was the lover of Calico Jack. Yes, there were women pirates, more than one. But I like her very much because eventually Calico Jack was caught and he was hanged. And her comment was, well, if he have if he have fought like a man, he wouldn't have to hang like a dog. Oh, very loving, <laughs> very, 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 very soft romantic girls, all of them. But as I say, piracy was big business in that part of the world. Um, but it was also another way to be a pirate, which means I'm not a pirate, I'm a private. Teacher. And now we're going to talk about the famous letters of Mark. What were the letters of Mark? Oh, they were pirates. But what happened is a king who, or a queen, and we know what queen we are talking about especially, could give a letter of Mark, which means she was authorizing a captain of her country to attack any boat of the country that they were at war. And uh, Well, uh, probably the most 
famous privateer was Sir Francis Drake. And we know very much who was <laughs> behind Francis Drake, our dear uh, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. And he brought a lot of Spanish gold and galleons to, the, to, to Queen Elizabeth. And that is actually what allowed a very, very poor England to survive at the time. A little market was a government license that authorized a private person, known as a privateer of a corsair, to attack and capture vessels of a nation at war with Asia. Uh, England and France were the ones who, uh, who were, uh, at, uh, had more privateers of concern at the time because they really had no colonies. They wanted a piece of the cake, of course. So uh, there were more people sharing on the cake, isn't it? Uh, but now we're talking about the cake and what happened. Well, the impact of the American gold and silver was enormous. It will help finance the Renaissance art and the technology. Remember, there was the 14, the 1500s. All, all these inventions were happening in Europe. The church had become less powerful, so technology was uh, uh, not satanic anymore and much, much more it was discovered at the time. But of course, you need money to finance these discoveries, to create these machines. So as much of it went into the pocket of the bankers, but it expanded the European economy and the countries that had financed Charles of Spain's wars. Some of the gold flowed into other European treasuries as other maritime powers, England, France, and the Netherlands, began preying upon Spanish treasure ships, is what I was just telling you. But much of the gold and silver of the time went into private enterprise and to finance new world discoveries. Because remember, uh, at the time, that money uh, financed the float of Olympus, Americo Vespucio, the, the Gama, the people who did the first circumnavigation circumnavigation of the globe, uh, Magallanes, who found the strait and the way to connect um, the, the Atlantic and the Pacific. So much was happening, but to send those, even to send later Captain Cook and all that, you need money. And all that money was provided by the discoveries in the Americas. So, there was another exchange that happened at the time and probably more important. What we call this day the Colombian exchange. The amount of goods, the amount of well, vegetables, shall we call it, uh, they went plants, they went from the Americas, as you can see there, and from Europe to the America. They were going to be not only important because they brought a lot of diversity, uh, but things like the potato, who was a source of very cheap carbohydrate, it was going to change the population of Europe suddenly the, popula the population was going to grow as there was a source of cheap food. The numbers were going to grow. The population of Europe is going to grow up to 25% within the first 100 years of the potato, or the, 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 the potato arriving into the continent. Of course, other things were going to be important. As you can see, the tobacco was going to be very important all around the world. And, um, and the other thing was uh, the, the cocoa, the cocoa beans. Um, at the beginning, with the cacao bean, at the beginning, people didn't understand what to do with that. It was bitter um, and, um, and they didn't have any taste. I feel much later that we're going about the 1800s, so in 1700, 1800, came the idea of adding milk and sugar to it. And voila. We have chocolate and we haven't stopped since there. <laughs> but at the beginning, what was this? What do you do with this thing? But now looking on the other side, of course, there were important the coffee bean. I know everybody saying the coffee bean came from South America, but no, in fact, the coffee bean comes from the uh, Arabic Peninsula. And, but a lot of coffee was planted with, and, and the Americas because it was the, uh, the right soil for it, the right temperature. And of course, today, most of the, the coffee production comes from the Americas, but it, they, it's not original for the Americas. And the same with the sugar cane that was planted mostly in Brazil. Um, 
But the two things that were more important it was livestock and horses, right? Uh, livestock was a uh, cattle, sheep, sheep uh, were put and not so much in the Cordillera area, but in the flatlands of what we call today uh, North America and in the Pampas of South America, what today is Uruguay and Argentina. And the horse was going to change the customs and it's going to change the culture in North America. But the other thing that it came from Europe to the Americas, as we talked earlier, it was disease. The smallpox, influenza, influenza typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, and whooping cough. And the people of the Americas had no way to survive those, uh, the, those terrible diseases. So there was a massive, massive what we call up to today, um, the Colombian exchange, which it was going to change the reality, as I say, the, the number, the population of Europe we were going to grow, and it was going to reduce the population of the America due to the diseases, right? Here, we have some of the, like, the, the elements that were more important. Potato, and yes, potato in Peru, especially where it comes from, comes in many different colors and in many different shapes. That is that's a photograph um, that I want you to see. Maize, that was also going to be very important, and gold. Right, that was going to create a very, very big Europe. On the other hand, as I say, uh, uh, coffee to, to, the, to the plantation together with, uh, with sugar cane. But now we're talking plantation. So remember that because that is this plantation where we have less people, all the, the indigenous are dying. We need to get, we need to get those plantations going. Uh, on the other hand, the cattle that was brought to the flatlands of, uh, of North America and South America, and most important, the horse. The indigenous of North America took to the horse immediately. And the horse became a very, very important part of the culture, of the way of life, or the way they were hunting. Right. So far, we've been talking mostly to what is Mesoamerica or South America, but now we're talking about North America. And the invasion of North America continent and its people began with the Spanish. In 1565, so we're talking later, right? Because um, at, uh, with the Aztecs and the Incas, we were talking uh, 1530s, around 1540s, but they, done, they had them all down. So only 1565, the, American, the Spaniards went to, to today Florida, and the British came in 1587, when the Plymouth Company established a settlement that they dubbed Ronacoy in present-day Virginia. The first settlement failed mysteriously in 1606. The London Company established a presence in what would become Jamestown, Virginia, and from there the French found the Quebec in 1608, so we're talking Canada, guys, and then the Dutch started in a colony in 1609 and present-day New York. While Native American resisting European efforts to amass land and power during this period, they struggle to do so with also fighting new diseases introduced by the Europeans. Now, I want you to see that map because people have, a, we have a completely different uh, perception. You see how little Britain had at the time. Oh, they had the, the part there in Northern Canada, but there were hardly any habitation and there was not much you could do there. Uh, but France owned a big part of what today is the United States. And look at how much belonged to Spain. Britain, or what we call the Spain was eventually the certain colonies, only had that edge there on the Atlantic. Later they were going to move. But the reality it was that, and that explains a lot of why uh, Britain was so desperate to try to move eventually into the into the into the West, because that was the best part of North America. Many European countries tried to claim and settle land in North America in hopes of resources and riches. Convicts were used as labor, 
and poor free immigrants, but also free land is prepared to work. You see, that was the difference. Uh, when the people who were coming to South America, they know, my God, there was there were mine, there were gold, there was silver, and you were giving people to work for you. And North America, you didn't have, there was no mine, there was no, there were not riches to make quickly. If you were there, you're going to have to work, and uh, and you were going to have to work hard, and there were no people to be working for you. So they tried desperately to bring people uh, across. So they brought convicts. Uh, to where the, who were offered freedom. Uh, they were endangered, they were endangered people. Um, is you, you get your trip for free, and cetera, but then for the next six years, you have to work as a slave for the English crown at the time to, to uh, uh, create the settlements. And they were very much trying to negotiate with the indigenous who live at the time. Uh, but there was a group, very important, Remember, we were talking about the separation of the church and Europe. And there were the group of the uh, protesters in England, which later they were going to call the pilgrims. The people were desperate for finding land, to find land. And as you say, it's there. Not all, um, let me get this, uh, uh, because I love that. Oh uh, dear, can I get that? Let's get me out there. Not all settlements journey to America seeking riches. Uh, however, uh, right, I can't, I'm afraid I can't. Not all settlers journey to America seeking riches, however. There were several groups, such as the Puritans, who were a separatist group. They were better known today as the pilgrims. They were protestant reformers looking for their own colony. They were prepared to work very hard to have a place they could call their own and they could practice religion according to their beliefs. I <laughs> just put a lovely one there. I just love that comic <laughs> there. We can see uh, the Indians talking to now. I think we need a stronger vetting of these Christian refugees. And um, very interesting because that's probably what we will say uh, in the 21st century if we have these people um, settling in our lands. Anyway, <laughs> uh, they say they are building a wall. That's in the Indians. And they say they are building the wall because many of us uh, enter illegally and we don't assimilate to the local culture. <laughs> uh, that is because all I want to say, what is happening at the time, and very much what it keeps on happening, nothing has changed. Uh, and the attitudes are very much the same. Well, let's see what happened in North America. We have 562 Native American tribes. We are not having, we didn't have like one empire or three empires that we had in South America. No, these were all different tribes, even independently. Some of them belong to a bigger nation, but they were very much different tribes, even in different places. Most of them, they were not settled, they were moving. So it was not about finding a group and fighting that group or having a war with it and conquer it. Every group was different and they all have their own rules and their own will to manage themselves. So for the settlers, it was a complete different setup that the, 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 the Spanish conquerors had in South America. And um, while um, they have, in South America, we have great empires, and North America, we didn't have that because, as we said, most of the people were nomads. There is a little bit uh, what we, we call the Pueblo, the Pueblo group. Uh, Pueblo actually means village in Spanish. Was a term originated with the Spanish explorers who used it to refer to the people of a particular style of dwelling. Um, they were actually the Navajo people who now reside in part of the firm of Pueblo territory, referred to these people as the Anasazi which means in reality, ancestor of our enemies. That was the highest form of civilization that we can find in North America. Very, very different for what we have in Mesoamerica. So these people, uh, they didn't really, um, they could move up and go. And uh, they were much more mobile than the people of Mesoamerica. 
there were also the Mississippi Indians. There is a bit of archaeology uh, find that we have there. And that was the other, what we will call um, culture that, that we found in the America that we can talk as, of, as such. But um, these were the two, these were the two, um, and both of them, as you can see, were in the south of what we call the, the United States. One was in the southeast, the other one in the southwest. And that means there was continuous conflict. Um, while they were, the settlers were fighting with one tribe and maybe they were conquered and maybe they, they, they arrived at some kind of settlement, they immediately have to be fighting with the other tribe. They obviously didn't agree what the first tribe was saying. And it was a, a state of continuous, continuous conflict, um, which means a lot of, lot of the people were dying, which means also made it very difficult for Europeans to want to settle there. Of course, since the Europe has started to go quite wrong, all the money that has arrived is being spent and people were desperate to find a place that they called their own. Many of them were liberated serfs. They wanted the land. So more Europeans start coming to North America and the diseases such as influence, pneumonic place, and smallpox devastated the Native America. Conflict and a right warfare with Western European newcomers and other American tribes Further reduced the population and disrupted the traditional society. And they started the saddest, saddest part of the indigenous America, the tribes of North America. They had to start moving to the West. And they kept on moving to the West and they kept on losing people and they kept on losing land. And that land was taken for the new colonizers, the new migrations and they kept on moving and moving and moving. And as we all know, there are very few of the original tribes live uh, uh, alive in North America. And um, there is important political movement about it, but what happened happened. And the people of North America today are most non indigenous, that indigenous. Within just a few generations, the Americans were virtually emptied of their native inhabitants. Approximately 30 million people may have died in the year following the European invasion. We're talking about 95% of the population of the Americans. So uh, that really changed um, the map of the Americans, changed the customs. And we are living in the America that it became a reality and refuge for the European. But the truth is, forever in the history of the world, we've been having migrations, immigrations, and people displacement. Um, as you can see in the north, the sack of Rome, what happened to the original Romans, what happened to the original Greek for that. What happened to the people in England? Well, well we know uh, first were the Vikings, then we have William the Conqueror. What happened to the original people of England? They are not there anymore. Where are the Celts? How many are left? What happened, as you see, Genghis Khan? We know what that in China, in all the lands of North China, the Mongols invaded, took over, and those lands today are but they have other people living in there. So we don't like it, but it's the story of the world. One group will take over the land, will establish, and they will become part of the story of that land. So we have, we know that in the 1700 and 1800, we have probably one of the greatest migrations in the world moving to the Americas. You can see that in the map, how the colonies, the places were at the time. And these were these enormous boats where the people were coming in droves to settle in the Americas. Um, most of them were poor people. People had nothing to lose. 
who were leaving nothing behind. So they were coming to stay. And if they had to fight the Indians, if they had to lose their life, they had nothing else to lose. So they were very determined. But not all the immigrants to the Americas came here because they wanted to, uh, to the plantations of uh, the Mississippi, to the plantations of the Caribbean, or to the plantations of Brazil, we didn't have enough people to manage them. And so they started bringing slaves from Africa. The slave trade was enormous. And we are going to be very upset with Lorraine and her telephone. <laughs> I know your telephone, it's not vinyl. And the big, big slave trade came to the America. It was enormous money to be made in, uh, out of the slave trade. And that also was going to change eventually the composition of the population of the Americas. Um, obviously, they were all coming from what we call today mostly Central Africa. And uh, at the time, there were the English, the French, and the, the, the Dutch and the Portuguese were very, very big in the slave trade. And while we know that at least 30% to 50% of all the slaves died before they made it for the coast, it was still incredibly, incredibly rewarding. So uh, we put a new element in the population of the Americas, and they were going to have incredible influence in the culture of the Americas. So what happened? We have a new South America with all the money, beautiful cities flourish, an enormous amount of money was invested there. And these photographs are my photographs, so these places do exist. And if you go there, I recommend it. There is Antigua on the top of us in Guatemala, Cartagena in the center, Lima down there, La Paz in, in Bolivia, Cusco, uh, sorry, uh, Chiapas in the north. Beautiful, beautiful cities were built in South America. Not so much in North America. They, were, they didn't have spare money. The people who came to America was, as I say, they were poor. They were not easy money to be there. The people had to work and work very hard. They had to commit themselves to the land. It was another kind of colonization, which in the long run, it was the one that was going to pay because those people were very thrifty. They were going to build, not to expand. There are two countries in the South America that were different. And there were Uruguay and Argentina, what we call, what you people would call the Pampas. It was exactly the same. First, they didn't have an indigenous population, or very little, the Argentina up in the north and the Cordillera. But the, there, there were no mines, there were no easy riches. So the people who came there also came to work. They were committed to the land, they were committed to stay, and they didn't have the facilities or the resources, and yet they created it themselves. So we have a little bit in a way that the, the part that were the poorer attracted the people who were going to stay and make it work. But by the 17, the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 20, of the uh, 1900s, we find that things were changing in Europe. Um, the Americans um, were unhappy with the, the crown. Um, the French Revolution was going to happen. The Napoleon were going to take prisoners, the kings of Spain and Portugal, which means the countries of South America, suddenly they didn't have uh, uh, rulers uh, to obey. Um, America was very upset, the 13 colonies, because they were working very hard and yet they had to pay tax to the English crown. So it was a massive movement, independence movement, and because these countries wanted not only independent, but also financial self-determination. You know, of course, we got George Washington there, we got O'Higgins, Bolivar, San Martin, Artigas, and... Um, the one of Mexico there. Uh, okay, I will remember it just now. Miranda. And uh, so it was tremendously important uh, because within 40 years, uh, all the countries 
all of the America became independent. And that in itself brought a major change to the culture of this continent. And um, I want you here to see what happened. Suddenly, all the people from Europe started flooding the Americas. We had the potato, the potato famine in Ireland, which uh, so remember what I told you, the potato suddenly made a lot of people could um, you know, live with a, with a source of easy food and you know, Ireland is a place of that. And the potato was blighted and the people went to the most appalling famine that Ireland ever know. But it was not only Ireland, other countries also had those problems. Some like the Chinese came to work on the railways of the American West. Um, those uh, uh, Italian ladies too, because they already they had had the wars there and the fight of independence. Uh, the beautiful poster there, in fact, it comes from Japan. Looks like in Japan, uh, Brazil was uh, advertising easy immigration to the country, and you can see in what conditions the people was were traveling. You know, it was there were cattle boats of course, and they were for months and those uh, and those boats, many people died, of course, of asphyxia or sicknesses, and yet the people were coming. Um, just one thing, uh, Janet, if you are there, sorry, I forgot the name of Miguel Hidalgo, very important liberator of Mexico. <laughs> and uh, so those were the people who were going to become the backbone of the Americas who were going to build. There were people who were desperate. There were people who were poor. There were people who were going to create a new world. And that's why it was called a new world. In the meantime, the Europeans were at each other's throat. Terrible times were coming and were going to be very destructive for the continent. They were at each other's throat. They were at each other's throat, not only economically, but also racially. And they were destroying a continent as the way it has been until there. And so, in this time, it was the Americas who came to help Europe. It was the soldiers and the equipment from North America who came to help Europe. It was the food the meat and the wheat from South America who came to feed the Europeans. And it was probably one of the great examples of one continent moving, lending to another, and the other one coming to save it. And I think uh, that shows us exactly uh, the real lesson of the movement of the people. That was a little, there we got our Siberian uh, 13,000 years ago, doing the first step moving across Bering into the Americas and keep on moving and moving and moving for another 13,000 years. And what he was looking, he was looking for the same that we always look. They wanted to create, they wanted to find a place they wanted to create a home where they could develop. And they did. And some of them are still there. Things have changed. The numbers are late, but they are very much there. And these photographs are all uh, contemporary photos that, that I took in my travels, you know, even in the corner there, the little indigenous from the Amazon. And yes, they are back home. Yes, things are bad. But they're still part of the Americas. And if we look today, um, uh, the, the, the configuration of the indigenous people still living in the Americas is, of course, very, very small. Um, probably the one that counts with more indigenous people are the ones with the dark brown or with the medium brown. And they were, this means that they have like about 70 to 80 percent of indigenous population. It's very much still the people of the Cordillera, uh, which is the Andes, and the people of Mexico, 
And of course, uh, in the north of North America, what we call the Eskimo, which is very wrong, <laughs> the Inuit, and, um, and all the rest now, uh, we are talking about descendants of Europeans. Of course, those people have become Triosos. Those people are people of the American continent. Um, I'm very, the little country there in blue had no, <laughs> no natives whatsoever, no indigenous whatsoever. That's Uruguay where I was born. But the story is they never had, they, they never had natives. The natives never indigenous, very, very few, and very few lived there and they never got there. Uh, but we have a lot of Italians that came later. And um, yes, the population changed completely. And we see that happening, and probably we see that happening with this major um, uh, uh, immigration that happened in Europe. And that time, everybody was getting away away from Europe, as we could see. They were all rushing to the Americas. Now it's a lot of people, they all want to go to Europe, you know. And um, I think that still there is much beautiful for you to see in the Americas. And there is still a lot that is left from these amazing civilizations. Those are the gardens of Cochimilco. Remember when I was telling you about the floating city of uh, the floating islands of Mexico City? Well, this, this, these days there are nurseries. Um, that is where you the, you go and buy all your plants and your uh, and, and your flowers. As and you take a boat, and sometimes the boats themselves are selling it to you. Cochimilco still exists, and Cochimilco goes back to the time of the Aztecs. Uh, for instance, there, the beautiful, the beautiful Mi Chiapas is, is one of the most beautiful provinces, and uh, which was Maya, Maya land. Those old churches, the, the markets, the textiles are something exquisite, and they're still made on the same tradition that they were before. Beautiful nature, like that is called Aguas Azules. It means uh, blue water. The color um, is not made. Of, I, I promise you, I have an adulter that uh, photograph. That is the color of the water. There is some mineral in it, copper and all that. And the, the water is the most unreal, unreal uh, um, turquoise. It's like bathing in aquamarines. Incredible culture. I, I mean, incredible nature. I was a Sulis. And of course, otherwise you could go to Lake Titicaca. The people of Lake Titicaca are still there. They are definitely um, their descendants of the Incas. And what they do when, when the conquest came, they retreat and they build themselves floating islands on Lake Titicaca. Everything is made of reeds. You can see the boat, their homes, everything is made of reeds. Of course, the, the islands themselves were made of reeds and they're still living there. Uh, Titicaca is the highest lake in the world, it's in between Bolivia, Chile, and Peru. And I really, really uh, recommend you to see it, or at least you will be able to, uh, to understand the culture that has managed to, take, to stay true to its origins. And for instance, the coast, the coast of that part of the world is so rich in life, you know, birds, and well, <laughs> beauties in the eye of the beholder, of course. I saw that there were tremendous beauties there because they got the Humboldt current. Of course, out, out of Ecuador, you will have the Galapagos. That in itself is, is an amazing trip in itself. But there is much to be had in the coast of the Pacific of, of where it was the land of the Incas. And amazingly beautiful colonial cities. Um, most of them, uh, I'm going to try to get myself out of this as much as I can. Um, most of them, of course, you can see uh, the tradition of the time, mostly Spanish. But the, remember that the Spaniards at the time, they had the Moors conquering them. So you're also going to find a more influence in the Spanish uh, architecture of the times. I mean, those balconies are definitely um, a part of the Moors influence and uh, the nature. For me, uh, the geography lends itself to hiking and to travel around. It's a still pristine, it's a still in very good shape. There you got the Cordillera Blanca, which is the white uh, Cordillera uh, in the Andes. In the south, you have the Atacama Desert, uh, 
and uh, there we got Chimborazo, which is one of the few single um, volcanoes in the in the in the Andes Cordillera. And last but not least, <laughs> the Colca Canyon. The Colca Canyon is um, where the famous condors are, and the deepest uh, canyon in the world, more than four thousand meters deep. Um, if you don't want to do the hike, and believe it's very hard, you can always go to the rim of the canyon with the other tourists and photograph the photograph the condors. But believe me, it's it's an amazing experience. It's about four days to trek down all the way down and up, and to have this magnificent. I mean, we're talking about three meters span to have this bird flying parallel to you as you're hiking and uh, as you're hiking on it. It's a place not many people know. Everybody does the, the Machu Picchu trek you know, or anything like that. But there are many other beautiful places to visit in that area. And talking about the Machu Picchu, uh, the Machu Picchu uh, trek, yes, I did it. It's, it's a beautiful experience. Try to do it in a small group. Um, I went on my own to the other places like Oliantay Tambo, which is in the mountains. Uh, it's very nice if you have more time than to do just the official trek. It's a very special place. Um, and the pity is that unfortunately, uh, places like um, in, in, the, in that part of the world in Machu Picchu, um, they have been very much exploited by uh, foreign companies. For instance, if you are a foreigner, you cannot just take uh, any transport to Machu Picchu. You have to take the, the official train, um, wagon leads, which is very expensive, very beautiful. Um, but you have to take the expansion because wagon leads, which is a foreign company, is managing Machu Picchu. Uh, the Peruvian guys are not allowed to be guys and that it, unless they are approved by a foreign company. And uh, the Peruvian people are trying to take that back, and I hope they do. Uh, but wherever you go, <laughs> Mexico, I mean, uh, as we spend a lot of time in San Cristobal de las Casas, where the Maya people live, we found that people are incredibly kind, they're incredibly helpful, um, and they are really still very much trying to live according to, the, to their principles. They have been very much oppressed, and they are having a very bad time. And unfortunately, we don't know how much longer that culture will survive. Um, but the discovering of the Americas uh, changed the world. As I say, they were not discovered. They were discovered by a certain group. Uh, there was a win for one, for some, there was a loss for others. But that is the world that we live together because the world is forever changing. People are forever displaced. People are forever moving. And that's the history of humanity. We started that way. In fact, remember, we moved out from Africa and we've been colonizing the world. And it's a journey of humanity. And I hope we all remember and try to respect those who were there before. And I thank you very much. I hope that has been, um, it's been good for your people and that uh, uh, you probably feel a little bit more interested in the different groups that populate the Americas. And maybe, maybe when all this is over, you take a trip over there. <laughs>